for being here. We're so excited to see you for our fall member meeting and also very grateful to our speaker, Dr. Deborah Khan, for being here today to talk with us. My name is Katie Starantino. I'm the Director of Wellness Initiatives. And without further ado, I'd love to tell you a little more about our speaker and get into today's presentation. So today we have Dr. Khan with us and we thank our members that told us about Dr. Khan and connected us with her. So we always love to hear from you. If there's someone you'd really like us to bring on to speak, we welcome that. Dr. Deborah Khan is a Philadelphia trained geriatrician with more than 20 years of experience providing medical care to older adults in many settings, including the hospital, the office, assisted living, skilled care, and in the home. She's been an educator, training medical students, residents, and fellows. She's been a team leader working with social workers, nurse practitioners, nurses, and administrators. Currently, she is working with families, helping to shape the lives of older adults in ways that make sense to them and their loved ones through her organization called The Journey Ahead. She puts her skills and experience to work to help families build consensus around difficult decisions which arrive, arise later in life. And you should be able to see her screen right now. So Dr. Khan, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to your group. And um, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, I um, am here today to talk to you all about medications and try to help give you some guidance in um, navigating the waters of pharmacotherapy in 2023 and what, what you need to know. Okay, so we're gonna go through a talk that I've put together. Um, I, there's a disclaimer and this is me, hi. So um, I'm not providing medical advice, but I'm here to educate and this is not a substitute for visiting with your medical professional. So please consult your physician, your nurse practitioner for any specific problems, but I'm here for general education purposes. Okay. And I've been working with um, this new PowerPoint software. So you're going to see funny and surprising things that, you know, I didn't know were part of uh, this technology, but technology is amazing and uh, pharmacotherapy is amazing. So all of these things, that there's a lot of good that's a lot of new good things in the world. Um, I have to move this, let's see, okay. So the obje my objective today, I, I wanna help you. I wanna offer some information. I wanna provide some tools to use when you're thinking about your health and the medical treatment you receive. Um, I also want to raise some questions with you for you to think about with your provider and to think about with your families. This is, uh, this is me, and Katie gave a wonderful introduction of my professional journey, but, you know, I'm also a daughter, a sister, I'm an aunt, I'm a spouse, I'm a mother, I'm a friend, a colleague a physician, a dog parent, a recently replanted resident of Philadelphia. So like you, we all have multiple identities and one of them often is a patient. And I, you know, I too am a patient, but that's not how I define myself. It's one of the components of who I am. I'm part of a large family um, currently, we have three generations. Unfortunately, in 2021, I became, at the age of 53, an orphan. My father died. So now we just have my generation, my nieces and nephews and their children. Um, and in this life, we're making an uh, effort to value our relationships, uh, continue traditions um, by carrying them forward. And um, so all of these people have all kinds of relationships, but most of them take some medications, right? But that wouldn't be the first thing that they say when someone asks them about themselves. Um, just as for most adults, being a patient is not their main identity. They have all of the relationships that I mentioned. They're athletes, spouses, colleagues, neighbors, readers, Netflix watchers. Um, 
and most of them have a health condition or two requiring them to take medication. We live in a really amazing time. I was, I was talking briefly to Katie before um, about this talk and I mentioned that I was having a little bit of anxiety about having to talk to a group of people that I didn't have familiarity with. And a friend of mine said, oh, well, just go to chat GPT. And, you know, I don't, I don't know how many of you all have familiarized yourself with chat GPT, but it is amazing. I went into chat GPT and I said, um, make a talk from a doctor to older adults about medications and uh, for 20 minutes. And it gave me an entire talk with slide one, slide two, slide three. So that, that's what I'm presenting. No, that's a joke. I'm not presenting anything from the chat GPT, but it's just to show you that you all are probably very aware in every domain of our lives, there's been change. There's been a lot of change and, and medications and medical problems are an area where there's been a huge amount of change. So think about all of these health conditions, right? Think about allergies, think about heartburn, think about infections, think about migraine headaches, Think about heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, hepatitis, and think about all of the treatments that we have available for each of these conditions. In terms of allergies, there's not just one pill, but if you go to the drugstore, you'll see probably 40 formulations of medications for allergies. And then if you go to your physician and talk about allergies, there'll be another four or five that the doctor is able to prescribe. The same with heartburn. Think about infections. I, um, you know, most of people who are in their 70s, 80s grew up with two or three classes of antibiotics. And now there are many more and they are able to treat many more complex and um, serious infections. Think about migraine headaches before there was Excedrin and now there, there's immunotherapy. There are so many different drugs that you can use, heart attacks, so many different treatments available in terms of interventional treatments and medications to help prevent people from having heart attacks treatments for strokes, treatments to prevent strokes. The whole area of diabetes therapy has exploded. If you think about when people just were able to use insulin for treating diabetes, and then there was this miraculous class of medicine, sulfonylureas, which came around and then people could take pills to treat not not type one diabetes, but type two diabetes. Um, and think of hepatitis. This is a disease that now can potentially in some, hepatitis C can potentially be cured with drugs. So there's been so much innovation and there are so many medical treatments. Think about AIDS. When um, I was in medical training in the nineties, there were treatments available for AIDS, um, but they were complicated. When I, before I was in, in residency, when I was in medical school, treatments were not widely available. So treatments became available, treatments became easy, and the death rate from AIDS plummeted in this country, which is a wonderful thing. But there are so many medications, so many complicated medications. Um, kidney failure is treated better than it had been, liver failure, heart failure. I remember when I was learning about congestive heart failure in medical school, the textbook understanding was that people had a short life expectancy associated with congestive heart failure and probably 
you know people who have been living with congestive heart failure for 10, 15, 20 years because of the wonderful medications that are available. Lung disease is still a very difficult problem to treat, but there are more and more medications and infusions that are um, geared towards treating lung disease. Cancer therapy has exploded. We have, you know, there are just uh, innumerable treatments available. And even people that have very difficult to treat cancers such as breast cancer, kidney cancer, um, now have choices after supposedly having failed treatment. There are more treatments and more treatments available. For dementia, there are new medications, new infusions. For depression, there are so many medicines. For seizures, so many medicines. What I'm wanting to communicate to you is that there are a lot of treatment options for all of these um, conditions. Um, and what happens if you have one condition, say you have diabetes, you might take three medicines. You might take uh, a, a lipid lowering agent. So that's like a statin. You might take insulin. You might take an oral medicine in addition, and you might have to be on a medicine to make sure your blood pressure is very well controlled. So there you are, just if that's your only problem, diabetes, which is a major problem, you might be at minimum on four medicines. What happens if you have two problems? What if you have two medical conditions? Consider you have congestive heart failure and prostate cancer, which frequently coexist over long periods of time. You are likely to be on a, a diuretic, you're likely to be on a blood pressure medicine. You're likely to be on a medicine that helps slow down your heart. You're likely to be on a medicine for your cholesterol. And for the prostate cancer, you're likely to be on medicines that block androgens. You might be on some medicines to treat symptoms associated with prostate cancer. So then you're up to 10 medicines. And what happens when you have three conditions or more? You can imagine that then you're going to have 12, 15, 20 prescriptions. And that's a lot to handle. And it doesn't mean that you're over prescribed. It just means that your life has become much more complex and you have things to manage that you never anticipated you were going to have to manage. This, um, you know, with, with one or two health challenges, um, your medicine cabinet can look like this. So this is pretty crowded, I would say, um, with antibiotics, ulcer medicine, um, some constipation medicine, you know, a, a, and it's pretty crowded, but take a look at this, okay? So sometimes medications can take on a bigger role in your life. And this is actually um, the medicine cabinet. Well, it's the medicine cabinet, but it's actually a kitchen cabinet of a person who was my patient when I was working as a supportive and palliative care physician in San Antonio. Um, so this is a man who lived alone um, in a small one bedroom home um, and he had mobility problems. So he couldn't come in and in, into the doctor to into the doctor's office and he had a lot of medical complexity. Um, so we, um, you know, so he, his medical problems included um, anxiety, depression. He was HIV positive. He had swelling of his legs, limited mobility. He also had alcohol use disorder. And, you know, but this is, how would somebody manage this medicine cabinet? 
I mean, I wish I could see reactions from you all. It's just really hard. And, you know, and I was talking to my sister just before this talk. She's a nurse practitioner in New York City. And I said, I, I just have a lot of um, admiration for people who manage multiple medications. But I also recognize how hard it is that you all didn't go to school to learn how to manage medicines. And all of a sudden you're hit with all of these medicines. So what do you do with them? How do you manage? Okay. And this is, you know, this is obviously this needed to be addressed. And what we did with this person is we looked through every single pill. We, I mean, not the individual pills, but every single bottle looked for, um, duplications, look, look for expired medications, look for inactive prescriptions and streamlined his medical life. I mean, I think if I were to open a medicine cabinet and say, okay, this is my job for the day to take these medicines, I would just have a stomach ache and wanna go right back to bed because I couldn't imagine having to figure out what to do with these medicines. And this is not so unusual because we are prescribing more and more we are turning into a pill nation. Um, this is from Consumer Reports. It's not a medical journal, but it's a um, reliable journal. Um, per 2017 numbers, in the prior two decades, the U.S. population has increased by 21%, whereas the number of prescriptions filled has increased by 85%. You know, the question is, is this a good thing? You know, and that's an important thing to ask. I think in some in some situations, it's a very good thing that there are more specific targeted medications available to treat more complex problems. Does it increase the complexity of a person's life? Absolutely. Um, has it had a positive Im impact on life expectancy and quality of life? In a lot of cases, yes. I mean, probably you are aware of the shifts that have happened over time with life expectancy in the United States. And it's not all, everything's not moving in a positive direction. There are a lot of areas where we're falling short, but treatment for chronic conditions is a, a very powerful, um, a, a powerful tool that we have. Um, but there's a lot of responsibility and concern that comes with more medications in circulation. So our life expectancy, what's happened? It's somewhat improved. Um, better treatments result in better outcomes. A lot of the medications that are, that are developed have uh, better side effect profiles, um, more targeted therapies. We're doing better in in some areas, um, especially in infectious diseases. Um, we have an increase in vitality and quality of life, and we have an increase in years lived. But here I am again, it's, um, it's costly, um, it's complex, and uh, people suffer side effects. Um, in 2021, the United States uh, spent 2.25 trillion on healthcare, which is a big number to swallow. It's about 20% of our uh, national spending. 9% um, of that is for pres prescription drugs and out-of-pocket costs are 10% of that. Pro depending on how well insured you all are, you probably feel if, if you're taking multiple prescriptions, you probably feel the financial burden of more medications. Um, you certainly want to be making sure that the medications are doing their job and that you take them for the right amount of time and that you don't, um, you know, that you take them properly, that you don't miss doses. So back to Back to this, it's not only the cost of the drugs themselves. When your medicine cabinet looks like this, there'll be more costs, okay? So if, if things are confused, if you have old prescriptions, if you have three different kinds of antibiotics with different schedules, there are gonna be times when you take 
the wrong medicine or you double up inadvertently. And there is a large problem in hospitals and in our health system about people taking the wrong doses and ending up hospitalized. And that has a huge cost to our society and to the person who suffers the um, misfortune. There's also a cost of combining drugs inappropriately. Um, if a person is on a blood thinner, for example, and they take an antibiotic for a, an abscess, a dental abscess, they could end up with a very bad outcome. The antibiotic can, inf can affect the blood thinning potential of the medication and people end up with spontaneous bleeds in their brain and then they're hospitalized and then they're incapacitated and it's tragic. So it's really tricky. These medicines that we take are really tricky and need to be treated very carefully. Okay. My goal, I'm gonna reiterate, and I'm going to reiterate things throughout this talk is to help you partner with your medical providers to improve your health and well being, to figure out what questions to ask and get the answers that you desire and make informed decisions. And I, and I want you to, you know, really, what you need to do as a person is to be a partner to your healthcare provider and give them information and demand information, request information. So when you are face to face with your provider, and they say, okay, Mrs. Smith, I'm going to give you exidine. You're gonna, they're gonna give you a, 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 some new medicine and you wanna know what is the medicine treating? And that's a very important question. So you're gonna write me a new prescription. I wanna know precisely what this is supposed to treat, okay? And what's a good, what's a good thing for you to do as a patient is to take notes when you're in your doctor's visit. It might make your doctor a little bit nervous, but that's okay because no matter how sharp you are, you're not gonna remember everything that was said during a visit. So, but you wanna have this information to refer to when you go to fill the prescription. Okay. You wanna know how long will it take to start working? There, there are some, classes of medicines that work within one to two days, okay? So some blood pressure medicines work that quickly. Some diuretic medicines work that quickly. Some medicines, and the classical example is an antidepressant, can take three to four weeks to work. But if you leave your doctor's office with a prescription for an antidepressant and expect to feel better as soon as you take it, you will be frustrated, disappointed, and there's a high likelihood that you will say, I'm not going to take this anymore. And you may or may not tell your healthcare provider that you've decided to stop taking it. But you need to know, so there's a lot of evidence that knowing from the outset how long medicines will take to, to work improves what we call adherence, which is a patient's ability and willingness to continue taking medication that's prescribed. The same is true with side effects. If we tell people what types of side effects they are likely to experience, they're more likely to continue taking medications in the face of those side effects if they are expected and tolerable. Basic questions like how much should it cost are important. A lot of people make decisions about whether or not to fill a prescription based on medication cost. And doctors and healthcare providers are often disconnected from that aspect of care, the cost of care. Um, so we 
do not always know what an antibiotic will cost. And we do not always know what an anti-seizure medicine will cost. But if you need to know that before you get that prescription, you need to ask. And then that information can be obtained in that office or, you know, or by your physician. Um, and then very important to know if the medication is compatible with other medications that you're taking. Um, for example, if you have toenail fungus and your doctor prescribes a pill, you go to your podiatrist and the doctor prescribes a pill to treat your toenail fungus, you need to know that that medication is metabolized in the liver and is likely to change the metabolism of other medicines that are also metabolized in the liver. So that's something that you need to bring to the attention of your treating provider. Um, it's also, I'll, I'll cover it and then more over. Okay. So what, what's my responsibility? And when I say my, I don't mean me, I mean you. <laughs> what is the patient's responsibility? I mean, me as a patient, you as a patient. It's really my responsibility to keep track of my medications. Um, I need to know, and you need to know when they were prescribed. So you have to have a log, you have to have a, a, you know, a place to write this down. When were they prescribed? What were they prescribed to treat? How long, using calendar dates, are they to be continued? So many times um, patients would come into my office or I would see them in their home and they would have written down to, to you know, take um, moxicillin for two weeks. Now, I, if you don't wanna have to go on a research project calling the pharmacy or, or finding all the bottles, you need to have calendar dates. So exactly, if it was started on the 7th of February, then it will be stopped on the 21st of February. So calendar dates are helpful. Um, and also for medications that are being prescribed that should be continued, when will they need to be refilled? And this is also something that's important to ask your provider. I have had, several occasions with patients of mine when they did not refill prescriptions because there was an assumption made. There was an assumption made um, by me and by them, but we made opposite assumptions. I assumed that an uh, antihypertense, a medicine prescribed to treat hypertension, when I put refills at the pharmacy, the patient would know that this was a long-term prescription and the patient assumed that because I had sent 30 pills to the pharmacy, then 30 pills was all they needed. So this is an important question to ask of your provider. Is this a long-term prescription or is this a one-time prescription? Because if you don't have that information and you stop taking medications that your doctor assumed incorrectly, we're going to be perpetual, then the next time you go into the office, the doctor might add a medication thinking that you were taking the other medication, not realizing that um, you had stopped taking the one medication. So it gets confused. So clarification, being clear about all of these things is really your responsibility. And, you know, I, 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 I didn't think about, I didn't say this to patients, but I have often said it to friends or colleagues or whatever that were waiting for test results. Um, what is your responsibility as a patient? You, the patient, are your only you, right? So, so like Joe Smith, you're, you're Joe Smith, right? The doctor cares about you sincerely, however, may have 500 Joe Smiths. So if you are waiting for a result or you're waiting to hear back from your physician, know that you have to advocate for yourself. So call again, call. If you if no news is not good news, 
No news is just no news. So as a patient, it's important. This is an aside, but as a patient, it's important to advocate for yourself. Okay, next. What else is your responsibility? Um, you have to tell your medical provider um, if you've been hospitalized, even if you were, it was an overnight hospitalization for a spinal procedure or you had an abscess trained, um, you have to tell your medical provider when you have seen another provider. Like I mentioned above, you've gone to the podiatrist, you've gone to the dentist, you've gone to the orthopedist, someone prescribed an antibiotic for your abscess, someone prescribed an antifungal for your toenails, and someone prescribed a pain medicine for your hip. Your main doctor needs to know that. And also, all of the doctors that you see or, or medical care providers that you see need to know what medications you're taking. If you started a new supplement or medicine, you need to tell your provider. Um, and alcohol has an impact on um, medications. I'm not, you know, I, I think that many people are well informed or have been reading the news and know that actually there's no amount of alcohol that's good for you. That doesn't mean that everyone has stopped drinking or should stop drinking, but alcohol does impact some medications. And it's important to let your provider know honestly that you drink, how much you drink, and if there's been a change in the amount of drinking that you've done, because alcohol affects your liver and it affects the enzymes that metabolize lots of different medicines. Also, I mean, you, you know, I, I asked Katie how, what the average age uh, that you people are in. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Um, that most of you are in your seventies, people in their seventies are people who were uh, young in their, in the 1960s and seventies and um, are people who have recreational drug use in their past and maybe present. And there's no, obviously what it needs to be something that you tell your doctor, you, your doctor needs to know if you are using cocaine, if you're using any any drugs and marijuana, um, because that really paints a better picture of how you will respond to medical treatment. So it's important. So um, after we went through that patient's medical cabinet, um, we were able to remove a lot of things, a lot of duplicates. And this is a lot easier to manage, right? We got rid of the duplicates and things that were not um, active prescriptions. Um, so with this, he was better able to manage his medications. And you see there's a pill box up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and that is something that is very helpful for most people um, in managing their medications. So have you ever seen an advertisement for a new medication? Um, there, the promises are miraculous, it promises miraculous improvement and there are beautiful images and, but then you hear all the warnings, all of the terrible things that might happen and you end up being confused. You know, I guess there are good things about advertising and bad things about advertising. Um, but definitely advertising works to increase demand for medications. Here's an old print advertisement, imagine. Um, so there are medications that we used to prescribe that we no longer prescribe. Uh, but advertising works. Um, there was a NIH funded study of 192 primary care physicians, um, which found that patients' requests for medications 
strongly influence prescribing practices. So when patients come to healthcare providers asking for medication, they frequently get them. And I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, so in this study, uh, about 20% of physicians would prescribe a narcotic pain medicine for a patient with complaints of sciatica at their request versus 1% if no specific request was made. So I'll tell you, um, in this, in this um, study, it was OxyContin. So imagine, you know, how times have changed. This is just nine years ago, and now no doctors are prescribing OxyContin. So you think that that heroin slide is silly, but think about this. Just nine years ago, patients were requesting and doctors were prescribing OxyContin for sciatica, whereas if the patients hadn't made the request, 1% of the doctors would prescribe that specific medication. And then 53% of patients would prescribe a specific non-narcotic pain medicine. That was that medicine that they asked about was Celebrex if requested for knee arthritis pain versus 24% if no specific medication was requested. So this is just a study that supported the idea that patients create demand for medication and doctors respond in kind frequently, not always, but frequently. Antibiotic prescribing um, is also problematic. Um, we, we over prescribe antibiotics. So this is something that's very um, commonly reported upon in the lay press. Um, one in three antibiotic prescriptions are unnecessary. Um, there are 47 million excess prescriptions written yearly for antibiotics, and it has a strong impact on the efficacy of our medications and increases the rate of antibiotic resistant infections. So there's a problem when medications are over prescribed and, and patient pressure affects prescribing. So, so we healthcare providers strive to meet expectations and avoid disappointment among our patients. Um, but we have to balance um, patient health and customer satisfaction. And probably you are all familiar with how hectic it can be in a, in a health care office. Um, doctors are busier. Doctors with, and, and doctors are busy. Nurse practitioners are busy and we have time constraints. Um, and what, um, what has been discovered is that doctors with busier practices prescribe more antibiotics and that prescribing antibiotics shortens office visits. And why does that happen? Because it avoids the need to explain why you should not get an antibiotic. Um, interestingly, doctors are more likely to prescribe antibiotics inappropriately later in their workday. So when their time constraints become more pressing, they're more likely to just write a prescription. And this is, it's not, it's not good for our, for us. So what should we do? What should clinicians do? And um, this is something that we should do when we have medical visits. We should review current drug therapy. We should stop unnecessary therapy. We should consider adverse drug events as causes potentially for any new symptom. We should consider non-pharmacologic approaches to care. We should substitute more tricky medications with safer alternatives. We should dose reduce when possible and use beneficial therapies when indicated. 
I'm going to talk to you briefly about um, one of my clients, um, lovely man, everyone, a lovely man. So he was 86. Now he's 87. He lives with his girlfriend. Um, he's, you know, a, a never, um, no children, um, very active as an artist, inspired to continue creating, involved in multiple projects. He has some medical conditions for which he's being treated. He has um, enlarged prostate. He has high blood pressure. He has arthritis, pretty significant arthritis. Had a diagnosis of depression, but he feels tired all the time, especially in the evenings. So what do we need to do to figure out what's contributing to his fatigue? And this is a very common scenario. Um, you have to do a thorough medical history. You have to do a thorough social history. Um, you have to do a family history, figure out what his goals are. What, what, is he, what does he want from his medical therapy? What does he want? And see what kind of testing is he willing to undergo? And this is pretty much for everyone you meet as a patient. Um, so the possible causes of fatigue, obviously, when you have an 86-year-old man, everyone's going to think of cancer. Oh, it must be cancer. But it could be heart disease, depression, thyroid disease, vitamin deficiencies, medications. So all of it's got a lot of possible causes. He could be not putting in enough hours of sleep. He could be drinking too much alcohol. Let's see, am I frozen? Uh -uh. No, you should be fine. I think it's just the font is getting larger. So if you click two more times, I think we should be out of it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's see, oh no, one more. Maybe one more again, or you can use the arrow. Okay, there we go. Okay, so how do you, you go to your doctor. If you feel tired, you don't know what's wrong and you're taking all these medicines, nothing has changed. You have to go and get an evaluation. Get an evaluation for all the things that you and your doctor agree are worrisome. So that's a consultation. That's assessing for metabolic problems. That's looking for underlying causes, looking at social issues. For this person, he was taking a medicine for his blood pressure and the he was not tolerant of the level of blood pressure control that he was achieving. His blood pressure was too low when he stood up. So this was one of these kind of simple fixes. If you take a standing up blood pressure, you're gonna have more information, especially in an older person, about if someone is being over-treated for a problem. And so the recommendation was to down titrate his medications and he felt better. Okay. So these are my kids in case you, you, you at this point in the talk, you probably need a little cute. Um, they're not that young anymore, but they're still very cute. Um, but the, the bottom line is when you have any kind of health problem, whatever it is, make sure you review all of your medications with your provider. Medication doses in older age. Medications can be more potent. The effects might last longer and we might be more sensitive to the side effects, especially heart medication, pain medication, anxiety medication, and diabetes medication. Every visit to a medical provider must include a review of medications. This usually requires no testing, you have to include all the supplements and over-the-counter agents, and it might end up resolving your problem. So if you're in a situation where you're taking more medications than you understand you're taking, you, at, you will ask yourself, how did I get here? How am I on so many medications? And the, the places where medications are added are hospitalizations, and that happens 
because frequently um, there are medications that aren't on the hospital formulary that you are prescribed from your physician and you'll go out on the formulary medicine and you're unclear of whether or not to continue the prior medication. A lot of people are very reluctant to stop any medication prescribed by their physician. So every time you're hospitalized, you need to have a medication review as soon as possible with your main provider to make sure you're taking the correct medication and the correct doses. When you have a subspecialist consultation, there are frequently gonna be opportunities for prescribing medicines such as pain medicines, muscle relaxants, psychotropic medications, so these are things that need that that can get just added on on top of all of the other medicines for your basic hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol. And if insurance changes, this is another time when like my patient in San Antonio, you have all of these old bottles that the one insurer paid for and then you get all of these new bottles that a new insurer paid for. And it's pretty overwhelming. We call it a prescribing cat. Well, then, and then there's another thing. Have you ever heard of a prescribing cascade? That's, I think that that's like Victoria Falls or something. It's just super beautiful. But a pre prescribing cascade is something that's important to think about. And that's what happens when you're prescribed one medicine. So, say you're prescribed um, a medicine for your memory. Okay, because you have early onset dementia. Okay, um, you develop urinary incontinence because that can be an adverse drug effect of that medicine. And then instead of reassessing the need for the dementia medicine, your physician or nurse practitioner puts you on another medication. Oh, oh, oh. sorry, for incontinence treatment. Um, so that's something that could happen. If you're on uh, pain medicine, non-steroidals, you might develop increased blood pressure. And instead of having your doctor reassess the pain medicine, your doctor might then prescribe antihypertensive therapy. So then you cascade up to now when you had one medicine, you have two or three or four. So that's a prescribing cascade. I know I'm running a little bit shorter on time, but I'm going to talk about this deprescribing, which is a concept that's um, really important. And that's when doctors and nurse pra practitioners and medical providers look at the problems that you're having and look at the medicines you're taking and figure out how to take away medicines. And these, this is very important, especially when people have frailty or dementia when they're in and out of the hospital, when they have limited life expectancy, it's really important to reevaluate medications and see if there are opportunities to deprescribe. The types of medicines that we often look to deprescribe are allergy medicines, long acting insulins, anxiety medicines, chronic antiacids, um, chronic pain medicines aspirins, um, but it's very, you know, these are things that you should not take on, on yourself. These are things that you can talk about with your physician and only make adjustments in medication in consultation with your medical provider. But because of the cascade that occurs frequently, deprescribing is something that also needs to occur frequently. And I'm just gonna reiterate these questions that I want you to ask. What is the medicine treating? How long will it take to start working? How should I feel? What side effects should I expect? How much should it cost? Will it interact with the medicines I'm taking? Know what your job is at, in the partnership with your healthcare provider. And remember to let your provider know about any changes that have happened with you. Um, I let Katie know about um, the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, handout. It's called Your Meds. And it's a wonderful um, 
thing that you should fill out. And I think that Katie's going to make that available to you um, to um, fill out information about your medications and carry it with you because you want to make sure that you know what you're taking, you know why you're taking it, you know how long you're taking it. And that's going to help you ensure better health. And this is me, Deborah Khan. I have a website um, and that's my email and that's my firm if you want more one-on-one -on -one discussions about um, your specific circumstances or your family circumstances, please reach out to me.